about 7.05. And um, as people try to join our, our uh, presentation, I'm just going to go ahead and let them in the waiting room. But before we would be begin, I would just like to say welcome, everyone, to this presentation tonight uh, by, by uh, Pete Nelson. I, I'm excited about it, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Pete is a marvelous presenter, and he knows his subject matter so well. It's just, it's, uh, just such a wonderful uh, thing that he is sharing his time and expertise with us tonight. And I know I am so appreciative, Pete. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us this evening. And in an effort to make sure that we have really good sound quality, we are going to ask that everybody keep their mics muted for the presentation. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't want questions. We do want questions. So we're gonna ask that if you do have a question, please type it into the chat. And then at the very end of the presentation, Kim Erland will go through and she will ask Pete those questions. So we, we encourage you to ask, but we, we'll just keep our mics muted uh, for sound quality. Um, and I would like to turn it over right now to Kim Erland, who can introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Kim? Thanks, Selena. Hello, everyone. I'm co-hosting this evening as North Country Community College's Diversity Officer and as a member of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative Core team. If this is your first time tuning in, you can watch recorded content on demand earlier uh, sessions that both North Country Live has produced as well as the Adirondack Diversity Initiative's Anti-Racism Summer Series. Um, these are all available on the YouTube channels for these organizations. Um, and a copy of tonight's recording will also be posted at both our North Country Live website, as well as diversityabk.org, um, and on our YouTube channels, which offer the option for closed captioning. We really, really want you to stay in contact with North Country Live, um, and we are planning a fall series. Um, it's still under development, but it will feature Indigenous voices and specifically um, our friends and neighbors at Akwesasne. So we're looking forward to announcing more details very soon about the fall series, which uh, we anticipate will launch on October 1st. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to tonight's presenter, Pete Nelson, who kicked off our August series earlier this month. Um, some of you have heard me say this but before, but for those of you joining for the first time, Pete has a background in diversity advocacy and education that spans back to the 1970s, including social justice programs in his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, um, tenants' rights and in the inner city housing area in Chicago, and equity in education in Madison, Wisconsin. Pete is a founding member of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative and a mathematics instructor at North Country Community College. He's also a proud member of our college's diversity task force. So thank you so much, Pete. We're really looking forward to what you have to share tonight. I'm looking forward to sharing it. First of all, just to make sure, can everybody hear me clearly? Good. Okay. I am going to start off by sharing my screen here. Um, So Pete, you are sounding a little bit jarbled. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you are sounding a little bit jarbled. Huh. Can you hear me more clearly now? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me know if you have more trouble. I've sometimes had a little mic trouble, but I think we'll be okay. So I want to talk about and I'm doing that because really, really interesting. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So, uh, researching these place names. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm no expert. I mean, um, this is an unbelievably complicated subject. So, uh, and that will be clear as we go. Um, but I will try to offer you a perspective that that may be. Um, 
uh, new to you or at least interesting. So first of all, uh, I want to have fun with this. It is fun and it's interesting. However, I can't go on without talking about very serious things first. So there's the cautions in it. I have some cautions to offer and, and I take these uh, very seriously. First of all, we really have to embrace uncertainty. Um, the history of naming in any context is fraught with mistakes, uh, false trails, uh, misinterpretations, uh, and that's all the more true in the Adirondack region. There's a lot that we just don't know, and I certainly am not going to claim to know something uh, that I don't. So I want to embrace that uncertainty. I also want to beware of feelings of ownership. It's interesting when you talk about names and you uh, consider um, a given name, once you think you understand it, you think you have some kind of an ownership over it, sort of because names are personal and you feel that personal connection. And that's a mistake. These names aren't my names. Um, these names are often uh, not any specific person's name and we don't want to own them. Uh, we want to learn about them. Uh, in this particular subject, especially in the Adirondacks, there's mythology left and right, and a lot of, frankly, bad scholarship. Uh, you know, a, lo a lot of um, authorities or claimed authorities on names who've written or published or presented things um, have only gone skin deep and, uh, and really uh, are, have missed the story. Uh, a Wikipedia search uh, doesn't help you, nor does most of written Adirondack history. It doesn't help either. So we have to be very careful of mythology, and you'll see that very clearly in some of the things that I'm going to go through. So there are real scholars out there, and I want to credit a few of them because these are people that I uh, specifically relied on when researching this. So the first two are Mohawk scholars. Garan Hio, Delaron, and Jordan Engel, who created a, a map, among other things, called the Decolonial Map. And it is a map of northern New York into Canada that shows indigenous names. It's really a fascinating website. Their work is really good. I want to credit Dr. Melissa Otis, who is a, a PhD uh, and an expert in um, Native American studies here. Uh, wrote a book on indigenous peoples in the Adirondacks. I want to credit Sally Svensson, who wrote a book called Blacks in the Adirondacks. She's an independent journalist and scholar of very, very thorough treatment. Uh, Dr. Phil Terry um, is a well-known Adirondack historian, professor emeritus at Bowling Green University, and uh, the late Mary McKenzie, who was the North Elba Town historian and a professional grade historian. So, there's a lot that will remain unknown, and there's a lot that I don't uh, have any expertise in, but uh, these people do, uh, and they've been very helpful. Last but not least, we can't and mustn't appropriate names in their history. When we appropriate these names, we misrepresent a lot of things, and we put our own privilege and our own perspective in front, and that's uh, irresponsible especially when we deal with some things that are sensitive. And some of this is sensitive. My conversation with you tonight uh, talks about uh, diversity in the park. And that history is mixed and it's difficult and it involves a lot of oppression. Uh, and I cannot and must not appropriate names or use them uh, inappropriately uh, if I can avoid it. I want to speak very personally uh, for a moment about one in particular. When I talk about black history in the park, um, there is a word that has largely been excised from published versions of place names. It's the N word. And the N word was rife throughout Adirondack place names. I won't utter that word. Absolutely will not. It is inappropriate. It is violent. Uh, it is hurtful. It has no place in scholarship. It's unnecessary to utter the word. I, uh, this, most people, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of some of my colleagues, uh, probably don't know this about me, but for many years, uh, I played in a band that had one of the uh, founders, one of the, one of the bedrock people in hip hop. And I've heard that word used a lot. It's not my word to use. Uh, it is 
uh, absolutely uh, the purview um, of other people and not me. So I will talk around it because its place in this history is important, um, but it doesn't need to be uttered and I will not do so. Okay, researching Adirondack place names also, and this is, uh, I guess, the theme that I bring, uh, that I'd like to bring to this, it reveals a more accurate and more inclusive history here in the park. And that's pretty important because the history that most people know that is represented in most publications and most writing about the Adirondacks is really mythology. And it's particularly written by privileged uh, males who were in love with the idea of wilderness. There was a wilderness ethic that grew up around the Adirondacks uh, and it got recorded. It was the dominant view and it still is. If you read the Adirondack Reader or if you read the history of the Adirondacks two-part volume by Alfred Donaldson, you get wave after wave of it. The problem is, is that mostly it's not right uh, and mostly uh, it's not true and in being not true. It leaves out or marginalizes lots of people who live, settled, and work here. Uh, and it leaves out, when it does that, really interesting contributions that the Adirondack region made to American history, of which most people are not even aware. So privileged visitors, privileged writers did name many places in the Adirondacks, usually out of, uh, out of <laughs> their imaginations, we'll put it that way. But the quote unquote common inhabitants, the people who lived here, who have always lived here and continue to live here, I have named many more places. So it's, it, it's uh, fun and, uh, and uh, satisfying to, to try to reveal some of that. So uh, just briefly, I want to continue to set this theme. So here's, here's the way most people see the Adirondack wilderness in let's say the mid 1800s. It's uh, a romantic uh, and very much of uh, transcendentalism uh, a, a movement, philosophical and, and uh, cultural movement um, that started to coalesce uh, around the idea of a wilderness ethic. So these three quotes, uh, I think, are very telling. And they describe each of them in their own way, um, a wilderness that is unknown, unexplored, unpopulated, you know, the first acts these echoes ever heard, writes Emerson, on the shore of a lake. Or the discovery of Dr. Livingstone by Stanley in 1871 is, you know, occurred before most New Yorkers knew anything about the Adirondacks. Well, that isn't really the case. So uh, now I'm going to try to do a little uh, technical wizardry, so bear with me. Note the date on Emerson's poem. He wrote the poem, The Adirondacks, in 1858. Here's 1858. Now I'm going to go away from PowerPoint for a second and pull up a high-resolution map. Hopefully you can see that high-resolution map in front of you uh, now. This map was uh, composed in 1858. And uh, I'm showing a tiny section of it. It was a map of all of Essex County in, in great detail. The section I'm showing is where I teach. I teach at the Ticonderoga campus. And I'll just briefly scroll through. But if uh, those of you familiar with that particular area of the park, you'll notice that the names of peaks, the names of almost all the water bodies, including in the Fair Lakes Wilderness, which is very wild today, um, water courses, all the way over to Scroon Lake and into the interior of the park, Paradox Lake, Crane Pond, Crab Pond, they're all named. And indeed, if I had time to take you through this whole map, you would discover that in 1858, almost all the major features in the Adirondacks were named or had been named and renamed. So we need to explore that because the idea that this is a wilderness nobody knows about rewrites history and it rewrites history the wrong way. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. So very quickly, like here's the traditional layout of Adirondack eras. You know, the transcendentalist privileged writers who wrote the history that we still read thought of it as a dismal wilderness, you know, rarely visited by Native Americans and uh, unexplored and empty well into the middle of the 19th century. 
And then we begin to explore it. Industry comes in and ultimately this wilderness aesthetic leads to a park. So this is the romantic version. Here's a much more realistic version and it will speak directly to some of the place names that I'm gonna explore. So first of all, the Adirondacks were never unexplored and they were never unpopulated from 9,000 BC all the way until now. They were the home of indigenous peoples and they've been the home of indigenous peoples throughout that history without a break. I'm not visiting, but living here. The archeological evidence, the oral tradition, uh, the cultural evidence is clear and unequivocal. Then after that, there was a period of exploration, uh, military uh, battles and conquests, mostly in the Plain Valley, and exploration that was much richer than most people realize. Uh, going down, um, those of you who um, sat in or listened in on my uh, Timbuktu lecture uh, have heard about the uh, great experiment in the Adirondacks to provide voting rights, uh, civil rights, and a level of uh, agrarian safety, agricultural success to free blacks here in the Adirondacks. It was a pivotal part of uh, American civil rights history. The same thing is true, by the way, for women's rights and suffrage. Um, so these are left out in the romantic version, they're essential if we look at what really went on here. I won't go through this in detail, but when we leave out the actual history, we lose a lot. All of these things that I've listed here, which I've talked about at one time or another, are all true. And they're all things that defined the uh, history of this country and affected it in ways that people don't necessarily know about. And at the bottom, as I know, when we look at place names, we're, we're starting to delve into this essential piece of history, starting, of course, with the indigenous peoples who have always lived here. So we're going to do, I'm going to do a cursory examination. When I say cursory, <laughs> like I said, you, I could, you, know, you could talk for hours on any one piece of this. I'm going to break it into just three pieces. I'm going to talk a little bit about indigenous history, a little bit about black history, and then a few miscellaneous place names that are just kind of fun. And this will be cherry picking. There will be plenty of you out there who will say, well, what about this part? Or what about this name? Or what about this story? And you will be right. It's something that I should have had in this presentation. But there is way too much to cover in an hour. So I've just picked some important examples. So let us begin with indigenous place names. And this is uh, more than any other uh, topic in naming uh, a good example of the difference between reality and fantasy, because there's a lot of fantasy. I kind of want to take you through this, and I'll talk about it. So let's start with the granddaddy, the actual name of the region, the Adirondacks. This has been debated a lot. What does it mean? Uh, the conventional wisdom, if there is one, is that it means that it comes from a Native American term, of those who eat bark or bark eaters. Uh, and there have been people who have said that's wrong. Uh, I will go with Mohawk scholars who indeed say that this word is derived from the Mohawk word, ratarantaks, meaning they eat trees, referring to uh, First Nations um, people from North who would uh, use the interior parts of tree bark to eat, especially when um, cold weather hit. Uh, and uh, actually I have some land in the Adirondacks with my wife and we have trees up there where if you pull back the cambium or the bark, it's totally edible. So I don't know if this was meant to be derogatory or descriptive, but it seems to be an authentic version of uh, a Mohawk term that has been mispronounced and applied to the region. After this it gets, uh, more complicated. Mount Marcy. So let's talk about the conventional wisdom. It's the highest point in New York. I figured I'd throw it in. And many of you will know this. Um, it was named for Governor William Learned Marcy, but it was renamed uh, or named by Euro Americans. And we've since learned that the Native American term for it was to house, which means cloud splitter. And that's a fairly well known term. Uh, that has appeared uh, in, in books and media and websites and everything else, except that ain't true. <laughs> so Tahas 
uh, was a term taken whole cloth from whatever source he needed by the American writer Charles Fenno Hoffman, who applied various versions of his versions of what he thought of as Native American names to all sorts of features in the Adirondacks. He thought that was very romantic. So the etymology of Tahas is, uh, is unclear, and it's simply not uh, a Native American term uh, that was used for Mount Marcy at any time that we know of. Here's the Mohawk version, Tawayesta. And by the way, to anyone who can pronounce Mohawk, I apologize. I am, I, I'm happy to announce I'm the worst person in the world at pronouncing languages. My wife, who sings in multiple languages, cringes when I pronounce in French or Italian. So, but this is the, uh, the Mohawk uh, term, and it means it pierces. Here's one of my favorite examples of romanticizing uh, names and the whole idea of peoples in the Adirondacks. Uh, the second highest peak in the Adirondacks is Algonquin Peak, and it is part of something called the McIntyre Range. And there are multiple peaks in the McIntyre Range, but there are three that are connected by a wonderful ridge walk, Algonquin, Boundary Peak, which is uh, too close to Algonquin to rate as a separate high peak, so it's not on that 46 list, but Iroquois is, so the next one to the south. So it goes from the north, Algonquin, south to Boundary, and then south to Iroquois. Where do these names come from? Well, first of all, they weren't the uh, original Euro-American names either. It used to be Mount McIntyre, named after the guy who started the McIntyre Mine Works uh, in the heart of the High Peaks. But it was renamed uh, after that to delineate the line between the two territories, the Algonquins to the north, the Iroquois to the south. This is roughly where they demarcated their territory, so there was a boundary between them. And that's been repeated over and over and over again. Guess what, kids? Nope. <laughs> it's a fiction. And it, I mean a complete uh, fiction. The real story is that the boundary was a surveying boundary. It was the northern line of the Totten Crossfield Purchase and the southern line of the old military tract and McComb Purchase. But it was a boundary line that was surveyed by Euro-Americans and it was directly related to speculation and uh, property purchase and division in the park. Um, the idea that to the north was Algonquin territory and to the south was Iroquois territory is also a fiction. I had a wonderful conversation with John Fadden of the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota talking about this and lots of other sources too. There are many misnomers, first of all, there were multiple First Nations tribe, who, tribes who spoke uh, a dialect of Algonquin. It's a language group. Um, and Iroquois is a term that's used, uh, but uh, Haudenosaunee Sony is a better term for the Confederacy of Six Nations um, to the south of the park and extending into the park. These groups did have conflict. They did have uh, battles. They did uh, have, uh, they did tussle, but they often didn't. And the territory of what we now know of the Adirondacks was covered by uh, both the First Nations to the north and the Mohawk. Um, and in fact, they shared trails. And much of their history doesn't have contention, and they didn't demarcate territory uh, with mountain peaks. Um, it's just a fiction. So it's a, a Euro-American boundary, uh, and the names are romantic, but they don't actually have a good uh, meaning in the larger context of the history of the park. Here's one. Whiteface. Okay. Whiteface, we imagine, or will read, was named for its white-colored slides, probably by early Euro-American explorers. And uh, if you look at Whiteface and you see the slides, which are white-colored, makes perfect sense. Nope, <laughs> not exactly. This one actually was taken directly from names given by uh, Algonquin speaking First Nations peoples. Um, and in the Algonquin language, uh, it was called Wahopartani, uh, which means it is white. So uh, people, um, Euro-Americans who learned that term and learned what it meant, copied it. 
and gave the name Whiteface to the mountain. Furthermore, it's not due to the slides. Uh, it's due to the summit rock, which is uh, gabbric anorthosite. It's a slightly different constitution of rock than the rest of the high peaks. It has an igneous intrusion that makes it white. The slides on Whiteface didn't even exist when it was named. Uh, they uh, came uh, to be in 1830 with a huge storm, but also as a bit of trivia created Big Slide Mountain. So this one is actually like a legitimate name uh, following uh, what we learn from Algonquian speaking peoples. And here's another one, Santanoni. There are a lot of assumptions that Santanoni is some uh, Native American term. It isn't. It was uh, the way that Abenaki peoples pronounced St. Anthony. And why were they pronouncing St. Anthony? Because they had an extensive relationship with French voyagers and trappers and St. Saint Anthony of Padua was uh, a patron saint. Uh, so somewhere in history, the Abenaki pronunciation of St. Anthony became the name of this peak. That, by the way, also belies the idea that none of this was explored or known. This naming happened a long time ago, uh, and it shows that there was a lot of cultural interaction in the park. Going a little bit further, when we look at some other place names, uh, it gets complicated fast, uh, and, and partly because uh, Euro-Americans have corrupted the name. They, they can't say it right, or they adopt a version of it, and it's really hard to sort that out. So a couple more examples, uh, one near and dear to my heart, Ticonderoga, um, which is again where I teach and a remarkable nexus of history for uh, thousands of years, really, uh, right up until uh, the, uh, the settlement of uh, wars in the Champlain Valley. And it comes directly from Mohawk, uh, Tagantiarogan. That's as close as I'll get. My wife is cringing, um, but if you uh, listen through Tagantiarogan, it's pretty close to Ticonderoga. So somehow that name got adopted by Euro-Americans. Uh, and it means it's at the junction of two waterways or a fork river. And of course, um, it is the site of La Chute River, which connects Lake George and Lake Champlain. The Saranac River, this, this is a good illustration of how complicated this gets. Uh, do I claim to know the etymology of Saranac? No. Uh, does anybody claim to know the etymology of Saranac? Yes, uh, but there's no agreement. So uh, when I was looking into this, um, there is a turn of, the, turn of the 20th century anthropologist who is quite expert in Native American terms. Um, this I got from uh, Melissa Otis's wonderful doctoral dissertation in a footnote. Um, he believed that it was a corruption of the Abenaki word Salanak uh, related to sumac, uh, and particularly a sumac that grew closer to the mouth of the river. But at the same time, Mitchell Sabatis, the great Abenaki guide uh, and Adirondack resident, um, he had a first person account uh, that it was from an Abenaki word that I won't even try to pronounce, uh, but meaning the entrance of a river into a lake. And there is evidence that it was the original Abenaki, Abenaki name for the area around Plattsburgh Bay, which is right, who knows. Uh, but it's just interesting to delve into and see how much uncertainty uh, we have. Um, and experts better, better than me um, will, will have to weigh in on the actual etymology of Saranac. I will conclude this part of it by saying though, um, I'm no expert in Native American terminology in the Adirondacks, but I can assure you that most of the place names you hear are faux. Um, there are a lot of them around where I live. I live in the Keene area. I have uh, a relative who just bought a house on a property called Nodineo, which is supposed to mean Hill of the Wind. Uh, there's no evidence that it means that exactly or that it's even a legitimate term. And that's just one of many, many examples. So difficult to sort out, but the takeaway is that these features in the Adirondacks, these essential parts of this territory have been named and known and climbed and paddled and swam and understood for centuries and centuries.
Okay, the second part, just talking about place names, uh, is uh, to talk about black history in the Adirondacks and Adirondack place names associated with it. So, first of all, um, ever since Euro-Americans have explored uh, this area, blacks have been part of that. Uh, they just, uh, you know, don't get mentioned in history. Um, but um, we know from scholar scholarship that by the late 1700s, there are hundreds of slaves here in the North Country, and there are increasing number of free blacks that are starting to settle, uh, that are homesteading, that are farming. Um, Minton Northrop is a fine example. Solomon Northrop's father, who was living in Minerva shortly after 1800, you know, very, very early. There are extensive records of black soldiers fighting for the North Country in the French Indian Revolutionary and Civil Wars. Um, some of them are early explorers of the Adirondack interior. Uh, Dyer Thompson was with um, uh, explorers uh, who explored the interior of the high peaks for mines. Lyman Epps, uh, who you'll hear about again in a moment, um, was a guide uh, and cut the first trail to Indian Pass uh, and was an expert uh, in Adirondack territory. The uh, advent of industry, particularly mining more than logging uh, and more than other industries, brought many black laborers to the region. And this is over a period of well over a century, more like 150 years. All of these mean that there is a presence in the park uh, of uh, black Americans. And so place names crop up. And this is where the story gets uncomfortable uh, and unfortunate. So first of all, place names begin to, to appear and ultimately they prolif proliferate. When I say proliferate, there are dozens of examples throughout the park. They're almost always about skin color though. They're rarely about personal names or if they are, that's lost in, in history that wasn't written in any detail. So a lot of incomplete and hard to sort out history. When you have more uh, generic names, descriptions, uh, pejorative descriptions, and you don't have um, the legacy of families and the personalization of it, it's hard to understand the importance of the names and the people who went with them. So it's incomplete. It's, it's very hard to sort out. Sally Stenson's book is wonderful and I highly recommend it. Uh, and it's a good example of, first of all, excellent scholarship. And second of all, how hard it is to dig through um, the extant records and start to construct a narrative. But what we can say is that most of these names were references that cropped up because of the presence of settlers or laborers and almost all of them were demeaning and dehumanizing. In other words, almost all of them used the N-word. It's important to say now uh, that that N-word, by the way, and this is clear from history, was uh, a violent and dehumanizing word for uh, more than 200 years. You know, the earlier references to that word are mixed, but they become negative uh, in the middle of the uh, 1700s uh, and even before that. And there's no question that when these names were applied here in the Adirondacks, they were pejorative, they were demeaning. So lots of names, I'm just gonna name, uh, give a few examples. Uh, in the Western Adirondacks, there's a, a Negro Lake uh, and not far from it, a Negro pond. In uh, uh, near Bloomingdale, uh, near Saranac Lake, there is a Black Brook or Negro Brook, uh, and that was part of uh, what you will hear on the next slide, something called the Smithlands. Uh, there is a, a Negro Hill, all but forgotten. Um, the name no longer appears extant on maps that I know of, uh, but it was uh, referred to that for a long time. It's near Elizabethtown. It was associated with mining. There was a large mining operation and there were black laborers there. All of these examples you see in these four actually used a different word than Negro. And to the, today use the word Negro or black instead. Um, it, you know, re, they've been revised as it were, uh, but it doesn't hide the ugly story behind them uh, any better. Not all uh, references were pejorative. Um, so you have to be careful. And this is where my amateur level of delving runs up against the difficulties in making sure you get the story right. So a few examples. Uh, one that I really like is 
uh, a steamboat that plied the waters of Lake Champlain and brought people to Adirondack destinations. Uh, an early Champlain steamboat was called the Molyneux. And it was named after Tom Molyneux, who is a well-known boxer in his day. And this is way back at the turn of the century around 1800. Um, there, it, his, his history is a little unclear, uh, but he was a slave and he won his freedom. Uh, some say he won his freedom uh, through boxing and wagers, but I guess nobody knows for sure. What we do know is that he was an expert boxer. Uh, he won uh, his matches in New York State. He lived in New York State for a while and then ultimately went to Europe where he became something of a celebrity uh, and was a celebrity as a sportsman uh, in the United States as well. So uh, this steamboat was named after him uh, in homage to his time in New York. His uh, life story is uh, difficult and uh, ultimately tragic, uh, but the name sticks. Uh, Black Brook, let me go back to that. There, I don't know how many there are in the Adirondacks, a lot of them. Uh, and some of them are clearly uh, demeaning pejorative terms, or that's their etymology or history. Certainly the one uh, near Bloomingdale fits that description. Others, not. Others, uh, historically, uh, it shows that the name uh, was given based on the color of the water, how close the forest was to the stream, uh, darkness, if you will. Uh, and it's hard to sort that out. Another example is a street near uh, where I live, uh, Negro Way, which has caused some consternation because it was considered pejorative. Well, uh, it's fair to consider those feelings always, uh, but Negro Way is an Italian surname. The road is named after a family uh, that first lived on the road. And then a fine example is Timbuktu. Timbuktu was a name that appears in Adirondack history, and it brings us to our next slide. And it is, of course, also a legendary uh, place uh, on the African continent. So uh, if we're going to talk about black place names, we have to talk about Garrett Smith uh, and his remarkable plan. Garrett Smith was a uh, white abolitionist, the son of a uh, fur trader named Peter Smith, who made a fortune uh, working with John Jacob Astor. Uh, and ultimately, Garrett owned more than half a million acres of New York land. His father gave him the business and the management of the lands. He was a strong abolitionist, also very strong in women's rights. And he came up with a brilliant idea. Since I have all this land, I'm going to give it away. And the reason I'm going to do that is because in New York State at the time, uh, there was a law on the books. If you were a white man, you could vote. If you were a black man, you had to have property worth at least $250 if you wanted to vote. Garrett Smith and other abolitionists saw the opportunity uh, to vote as critical in securing civil rights and citizenry, full actual citizenry for black Americans. So he gave away 120,000 acres of land in the Adirondacks to black families who could move from downstate, take possession of the land, farm it, and improve it to the point where the value was high enough that they could vote. Also, the agrarian life was considered to be, uh, by many abolitionists, to be a dignified uh, way to build mixed communities that were safer um, for Blacks. So it, the idea was uh, hot for a while. I mean, it was promoted by leading abolitionists. I won't read every word on the slide, but those are names that many of you will recognize, of course, Frederick Douglass. Ultimately, uh, of a combination of factors made it hard for this plan to succeed. So less than 150 families accepted grants. But there were two areas in the Adirondacks in particular where these communities began to grow. And the place names that go with it are interesting. So one was Timbuktu. Timbuktu, which I talked about a couple weeks ago, was the largest of the free black settlements in North Elba, near the ski jumps. Um, and the, the uh, Epps family, uh, Lyman Epps Sr. being the explorer I referenced, uh, the guide that I referenced on a previous slide, anchored that community, uh, founding the church, um, starting the school, um, and became fixtures of the community for more than a century. And uh, that's the longest legacy uh, from this uh, era. 
an interesting footnote to Timbuktu, which ultimately plays a very important role in establishing the idea of free soil and black voting rights, but ultimately um, fades mostly into history. One interesting footnote is this, uh, once again, showing that the whole question of place names is uh, difficult. You can't take the things for granted. So is Timbuktu a misnomer? If you, um, if you follow what Mary McKenzie researched, uh, it is. Um, she uh, researched the name Timbuktu and determined that it was used by John Brown, the abolitionist who moved to, this, uh, to these free lands uh, to help this project succeed. He used it in the letter in 1848, and the word was not used again for many years until John Brown used it again. None of the black families that lived there ever referred to in any correspondence, any letters, some to families, anything at all, uh, doesn't use the word. It's Alfred Donaldson in his 1920 uh, History of the Adirondacks that popularizes the idea that it was named Timbuktu. There's really not any particular evidence that that's what anybody called it, except John Brown in his letter and Donaldson almost uh, a century later. Still, uh, the idea of it and the reality of it as a place name is essential in civil rights history. The other place which has faded away was uh, specifically named Blacksville. It's uh, by present day Loon Lake. And this was uh, uh, the dream of an abolitionist named Willis Augustus Hodges, who was a, a, a strong uh, black abolitionist uh, newspaper publisher, writer, orator by uh, all accounts, an excellent orator. And he, um, he gathered a few families to take uh, these uh, land grants from Garrett Smith to start a community that he hoped would be an agrarian model for uh, blacks throughout the country. And again, uh, it didn't work out. Uh, lots of reasons for that. The fugitive slave law, the difficulty of farming in the Adirondacks, the amount of money that it took to start a farm from nothing, those proved to be impediments. But it was his dream, and Blacksville was a place. Uh, it has uh, faded, uh, but its history has not. Uh, there were many other locations where the Garrett Smith uh, uh, experiment and these Smith lands uh, affected uh, Adirondack history, uh, Vermontville, St. Armand, and elsewhere and including some places outside the park. Most of that history uh, has faded or uh, names have been altered. But when we look back on it, we understand uh, that we can't compartmentalize black history as though it's something different from Adirondack history. It isn't. Uh, and because of the importance, the centrality of civil rights up to this day, of course, uh, it's important history. So that's the second piece. Finally, just for fun, I included a few others just to show how broad this range of place names is, how, how interesting or complicated it gets. These are, are uh, I would say, more well-known, and I would hazard a guess that many in the audience uh, know these um, or the stories behind them, but I'll just run through them quickly for two minutes uh, and then leave some a uh, little bit of time for questions. So um, Adirondack Lodge is the uh, most popular hiking destination in the High Peaks. Why is it Adirondack Lodge L-O-J? Probably many of you know this, but that place name was because of Melvin Dewey, the librarian, writer, and scholar who uh, created the Dewey Decimal System and was uh, very interested in reforming language to make it syllabically less complicated. He didn't want a D, a G, and an E when a J would do. So it was Adirondack Lodge. He renamed it from Adirondack Lodge with the D, the G, and the E uh, just before the turn of uh, 1900. It's worth saying that Melvin Dewey was a virulent racist and sexist whose Lake Placid Lodge, uh, Lake Placid Club, excuse me, uh, would not admit blacks, women, or Jews. Uh, Anti-Semite as well, obviously. He, he, was not, he was not what you'd call a, uh, an inclusive guy. Uh, but his legacy lives on in this odd spelling. Calamity Pond is one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, it's in the middle of the southern parts of the High Peaks Wilderness. You walk along a trail for four miles, you turn a little corner, and there's a marble monument sitting in the middle of the wilderness. You wonder, how did it ever get in there? Uh, it was dragged by oxen 
uh, the pond was called Duck Hole until David Henderson, who was uh, one of the founders of the McIntyre Iron Works, was accidentally shot there uh, in 1845. The monument's still there, and that is now Calamity Pond. It's a beautiful place. Esther Mountain, another fine story that many of you may know. Esther Mountain, until recently, was the only one of the 46 Adirondack High Peaks that was named after a woman. The other 45 were all, all named after men. Imagine that. Now we have added Grace Peak, uh, not too far from where I'm sitting, uh, named uh, in honor of Grace Hudalowski. But Esther Mountain was named in the last, uh, actually, two centuries ago almost, uh, for a young woman, in fact, a girl of age 15 named Esther McComb, who decided to go climb Whiteface. No trail, I'm just going to go up there. Uh, a, a plucky move for any person. Uh, and she got lost. And she ended up on the wrong summit and spent the night there before she was found and got her way out of there. So if you climb Esther Mountain, there's a plaque up there, a bronze plaque in memorial to Esther McComb, the first uh, person to summit it, first year all American, I should say. Lake Bonaparte, this is another one of my favorites that maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't. The real brief version of this one, this is just outside the park to the west. Uh, Lake Bonaparte, that's suggestive. Could it be that it's named after Napoleon Bonaparte? Yes, it could. It's named after him or his brother Joseph, uh, and it's named uh, in remembrance of a failed attempt by Joseph Bonaparte to buy thousands of acres of Adirondack land in the Western Adirondacks to which Napoleon could escape and lead a life of relative uh, peace and comfort. And in fact, Napoleon had sewn coins into his vest and uh, you know, snuck some belongings into his pockets and was ready to get on a ship that was gonna take him to the United States before the British intercepted him and he ended up spending the rest of his time uh, in uh, on Elba. <laughs> so um, there was uh, almost, uh, almost uh, a Napoleonic dynasty in the Western Adirondacks, but uh, didn't happen. Uh, that brings us to North Elba. Why is North Elba North Elba? Well, Elba, the colony that the aforementioned below, uh, Napoleon spent time at, was a famed source of uh, iron, minerals. Uh, it was a mining uh, mecca. And when early miners uh, found ore, iron ore, in the Lake Placid area, they wanted to be optimistic. So they named that area Elba until a few years later, uh, it was discovered that downstate there already was an Elba, New York. So they had to change it and they changed it to North Elba. And that is of course the name of the town to this day. Peru, just outside of the park to the north. Why Peru? Same sort of theme there. Peru was named because French explorers pushing south along Lake Champlain saw high mountains to their west, the Adirondacks, and imagined that there could be stores of gold and silver, much like the legendary country of Peru. So these were the Peruvian mountains before they were the Adirondack mountains, so named by the French. A town still carries its name forward. And finally, Racket Lake. Ragged Lake, no one knows, but the story is that Sir John Johnson, a British Tory, uh, escaping from American troops uh, at the commencement of the Revolutionary War, was guided by Mohawk allies who took him on an ancient and long-standing Native American trail that connected from uh, the Mohawk Valley along the Hudson River all the way to Canada. Uh, along the Fulton chain of lakes and then up uh, to the northwest from there. Uh, when they came to Racket Lake, uh, the snow they had been traversing in snowshoes had melted too much to use the snowshoes, so they discarded them all in a huge pile on the shore of Racket Lake, and the French word for snowshoe is racket. That one is, we'll say, unverified. So, there are a plethora of place names in the Adirondacks. They are all fascinating and they tell a much richer history than that this was just an empty wilderness. And with that, I will take any questions that people have and I thank you very, very much for, uh, for listening.
Thank you so much, Pete. That was fascinating. Um, and so uh, now is a good opportunity to type questions into the chat for Pete, um, and I'll, I'll get through as many of them as I can. Um, looks like one person wants to know if the story, if there's an indigenous story behind the Split Rock Mountain uh, name, or if that's also um, a false uh, tale. Wonderful. So uh, the first part of the answer is, I'm not sure. Uh, the second part of the answer is, I don't know if anybody knows for sure. What I can tell you is that when the French and the British were contesting uh, in the Champlain Valley, the French were allied with First Nations, uh, Algonquin speaking peoples, uh, and uh, the British were allied with the Iroquois. This because Samuel de Champlain made an enemy of the Iroquois in 1609, and that carried on for more than a century. So Split Rock was named in the Treaty of Utrecht uh, in 1730-something. I don't have it in front of me. I think 1731 or something like that. I have to look it up. But this treaty was negotiated to establish a peace between the British and the French, and Split Rock is specifically named in that treaty. Everything north of Split Rock is French territory. Everything south of Split Rock is British territory. It's been said, and this is the part where I don't know, that that demarcation was also based on the idea of how the Native Americans viewed their control of the Champlain Basin uh, I and I know others are skeptical of that because the idea of territory that you Americans have is completely alien to um, the way that uh, Native Americans uh, look at land and share it and consider it. So uh, maybe somebody in our audience knows better than I do. But as far as I know, um, it's definitely a demarcation that you Americans established by treaty. It's a big question whether that was actually any kind of demarcation used by the Native Americans who shared this landscape. Thanks, Pete. Um, another person is wondering if the place name Osita, um, if you know where that comes from, O-S-E-E-T-A-H? Oh, I know the name. Um, I do not know where it comes from. I haven't researched it. Uh, I won't even begin to try to tell you if I know about, uh, you know, anything about it. I do not know that. My apologies. Not a problem. Do you have any recommendations for sources to learn more about um, what we've talked about tonight in, in general? Um, uh, some of our listeners are, are interested in doing some more of their own self-directed learning. Yes. Um, there are a number of sources, but I would start with uh, the book that Melissa Otis wrote. And uh, just give me one moment here. I will be right back with you in just a moment. It sounds like there's interest in understanding some of those um, property names that you mentioned to Pete and, and trying to decipher whether they are truly uh, Native American in, uh, words or in stories or if they have that, uh, that faux uh, heritage. Yep, um, I'm sharing my screen, ladies and gentlemen. This is a, a search so you can see uh, uh, information on this book. You can search for it yourself. But Rural Indigenousness, History of Iroquois and Algonquian Peoples uh, is um, really, really good. Uh, and it talks a lot uh, about uh, the broad tapestry of this history. There are, um, there are some other sources for uh, place names. Um, let me try to pull up uh, while you're looking. Um, and we can place these resources on our um, college's diversity website mm -hmm. um, for uh, attendee attendees to revisit as well. Okay, so this is the um, this is the atlas I referred to earlier. Uh, and it has a, a wide range of information about uh, place names uh, and um, not 
so many in the Adirondacks, uh, but in the North Country as a whole into Canada, a very thorough um, listing uh, and exploration of these names by Mohawk scholars. Um, and so um, I, I highly recommend that. Yeah, that sounds great. And it's, um, it's uh, wonderful how tonight's talk is an excellent bridge between our August topic and our fall uh, series coming up um, on, on the indigenous voices of our region. Um, any other questions from our attendees this evening? All right, we've got another uh, listener saying um, they've heard a lot of the, the brooks and streams named in the area that, that may have been named using that N-word originally and were renamed later. Um, uh, and I think you spoke a little bit about that um, earlier, Pete, but is, is there anything else you can expand upon related to those place names? Just two things. First of all, um, what Leslie has typed in as far as I know, is correct. Um, I don't know the details about it, but I have heard the same thing. What I can tell you is that there have been, you know, purposeful efforts to rename um, uh, features in the Adirondacks that have offensive names, particularly using that N-word. Uh, and uh, so those have been organized efforts. Uh, and so I have heard the USGS did that as well, and Niagara being um, uh, a perfectly reasonable term. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Selena then to close the evening out. And again, thank you so much, Pete. This was wonderful. I had a great time. I hope people enjoyed it. Um, I just think this stuff is fascinating. I don't claim to be an expert, but I love delving into it and sharing what, uh, what I can. Thank you. Absolutely, a good lesson in information literacy. <laughs> thank you so much, Pete, wow. That's the only word I can come up with. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I really enjoyed that. And I hope all of you did as well. I wanna say a couple thank yous. One to our North Country Community College Foundation, um, our enrollment team who has been supporting us all the way, our opportunities group, but most important, I wanna thank all of you for sharing another evening with North Country Live as we went into further exploration of Black history in the Adirondacks. We have lots coming up in the future, so we hope that you can join us in the fall for our fall series. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you soon.